Well, I promise not to preach too long this morning, but that's an oxymoron coming from a preacher, right? You heard the new installation of our new hand dryers in the bathrooms. We're getting electronic ones, and um, we had, I had installed them, but then somebody had put a sign above the men's one that says, for a sample of this morning's sermon, press here. So um, <laughs> I took it out. All right. Thank you, all of those that join, you on, join us online. We had more than 1,100 people last week download the sermon and or look at our LarrySermonBlog.com and uh, the churches. Uh, praise God for that. But I'm glad those of you that are here, we want those of you watching to come to church. Yes, be in the house. COVID is like, okay, it's over, you know. And if it's still around, it's you know, going to come and go, like your average flu. So anyway, um, we've been going through uh, a study on the Holy Spirit, and we've made some uh, significant strides addressing this question, who is the Holy Spirit? There are some 260 scripture references in the New Testament alone regarding Holy Spirit and what he's done. So where do you begin? So our focus is really on the words of Jesus from John chapter 14 through 16, and um, we've been drawing a lot of, of things from there, and there are a lot of places to go. So really, John 13 to 17 uh, are all one big discourse. So if we read in the scripture here, uh, uh, the Last Supper. So all these guys, the disciples, are excited at first, and they, they've come to the upper room, and they're going to be with Jesus, and they're all sitting there, and this is kind of an exciting time. They've come for the um, to be with him and to feast with him. And so it starts in John 16, but he comes out and he starts the conversation, but it takes a quick turn from being excited to be there to something else, um, that he's going away. He said, I'm going to go away. I'm not going to be here any longer. He, is gonna, he says he's going to die, and they're not only going to kill me, but they're going to kill you. Now, how would you feel in that moment, right? You're excited to share this Passover. There's been several miracles leading up to the ability to even be in this room. And then all of a sudden, here you are sitting with the, the creator of heaven and earth. And through God, through Jesus, um, God is speaking and he is God and he speaks. And they're, now they're worried. And they're saying the word here in scripture that they're, they're so worried. The word here gives a connotation that there's little room in their own heart for anything more. That their room is squished, if you will, with the information. And, and so it's all-consuming fear that they have. They're, they're very afraid. The, um, the word uh, in many of your Bibles in verse 6 of chapter 16 says they were filled with grief. Filled with grief. I mean, I wonder if uh, you were told that you were going to be hunted down and killed how you would feel. And by the way, those that hunt you down and kill you um, will believe that they're doing God's work. That makes it even better, right? That's just icing on the cake. Um, not only are they going to be killed like this, they're going to be hunted down in Greece and Asia Minor. They're going to be, uh, you know, hunted down in, in Jerusalem. And all of them, except for John, was martyred. And it, now, that doesn't fit too well into our modern-day TV preacher prosperity gospel very well, does it? Um, but so Jesus tells them this, but then they're going to promise, that Then, but then he gives them this promise. He tells them that he's going to go away, that he's going to die, but then he says, I want you to know that I'm not leaving you here alone. Now, here there's some disconnect, and, and here is where I think in today's church, the forgotten God is the Holy Spirit. And we always have a group of people that Father is God, I mean, even agnostics argue against that, but nonetheless, since they don't know, um, that's their primary target. So, But almost, the most faithless understand that there is a Father God. Jesus is God. That's where you might lose the Jehovah's Witnesses and some of that crowd, right? Um, the, the doctrine of the Trinity is a solid biblical doctrine. Any doctrine that's outside of the Trinity is non-biblical. It's just clear. And so then the, the Holy Spirit also is God. We've taken a, a long look at that. So there's, I think today that there's some cute confusion about the working and the Holy Spirit and who he is and what he will do. So 
Jesus continues to speak to them, and they're very concerned. I mean, they're really worried, and their expectations were based upon the prophecy that they knew, right? The Messiah would come. Jesus would come. There would be this uh, precursor, this Elijah spirit, if you will, that was fulfilled in John the Baptist, and John the Baptist was the one who came and paved the way for the Lord. All of this was fulfilled in Jesus. These guys walking with him, they recognize this. They know this is what's going on, and they're like, yes, Jesus, this is it. <coughs> Excuse me. So their next anticipation is that he's going to come into Jerusalem and he's just going to take over. And Jesus is really plain in his explanation in John 16. He continues in the first 11 verses and he says, We learn some things about the Holy Spirit. We learn from Jesus' words that the Holy Spirit is God, He is a divine person that helps us. This is the definition that I've given our church for this study. The Holy Spirit is a divine person who helps us. Jesus calls him the helper. He calls him a he, not an it, or a force that can be moved or thrown around by my hands or wished into existence. Um, And the first primary job of the Holy Spirit that we looked at last week, a lot of traction on this one, is the Holy Spirit's first job is to convict the world of sin. Why? Because they do not believe in me. The first work of the Holy Spirit is to make people who are not saved miserable. I'm sure you live with or around somebody who's miserable because in their life they've come up against this constant connection, this striving of belief, this conviction of the Holy Spirit that tells them that, yes, they're sinners. We don't use that word anymore. We use negative behaviors. But this is not about behavior. This is about your status. We all have negative behaviors that we call sinful behaviors, and our conscience will do plenty of good job of convicting us of that. But Jesus says the sin of unbelief is the most egregious sin that there is. Unbelief is the thing that keeps people away from the love of God and salvation and hope that there is in Christ. People live their whole life and they fill that void when they feel little conviction here or there with everything else, with the philosophies of this world, with the things that can satisfy in this world, living from one height to the next rather than realizing that they were created with a purpose and the Holy Spirit's job is to convict the world of the sin of unbelief. Now, people over time, as we get older, we learn how to develop all kinds of habits and fill all kinds of places in our life against those arguments so we don't have to surrender the one big thing that we like to hold on to, our own authority. Surrendering that is a big thing. So at the end of verse 11, imagine we find, you find yourself with these guys, and they're in the room. Eyes wide, right? Jesus says, I'm going away. What? A little wider. I'm going to be killed. What? And you will be too. What? Say what? I mean, their their own demise, his departure, the work of the Holy Spirit. And then in in addition, Jesus is telling them another cliffhanger by telling them there is more to say to them, but he can't say it right to them right now. Oh, by the way, you guys are on information overload. I can see, you know, the wheels are turning in their heads, steam rolling out their ears. They're they're just like, they're contemplating every word. They've seen and walked with the master of creation. They've walked with him. They've seen his miracles. They've heard his teaching. They understand the great love of the master. Uh, They understand the great love of God, the sentiment of the world. And now this cliffhanger saying, hey, guys, this is too much information for TMI. You know, too much. Uh, You're going to have to wait. So let's pick up the reading in John chapter 16, and we're going to address one other attribute of the Holy Spirit this week, as we will do in in weeks to come. Verse 12, so all of that has happened, and they're sitting here, and then these words come out. Verse 12, I still have many things to say to you, but cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me. This is Jesus talking, so the Holy Spirit's going to bring glory to Jesus. He's going to talk about Jesus. For he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Jesus gives us another quality of the Holy Spirit here. He has already said the, the Holy Spirit is God. He has already given us this idea that he is the divine helper who helps his people find Jesus by convicting them of their sin, sinful nature, not behavior. We're all born in, we all have a sinful nature. God wants to save us from that. Our behaviors, he's working on us the whole, our whole life, right? Not one of us is perfect in this room, that's right. 
How many sped on the way to church this morning? Shame on me. Yet I have found very little people repenting of the sin of speeding. (laughs) Right? So our conscience does a lot of work, but the Holy Spirit convicts us of our nature, not our behavior. Jesus says that this quality of the Holy Spirit is huge. He's going to do something else. Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the Spirit of Truth. And this isn't the first time he calls him the spirit of truth. In John 14, verse 15, a couple chapters back, he says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. I like that because Jesus was with them. They they walked with him. They went to each other's house. Jesus, they saw him, right? And just like me, Jesus says, another helper like me. Wow. You're not going to be alone. He'll be with you forever. Verse 17, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him. You know him, for he dwells in you and will be with you. Now, John 15, verse 26, he also says, one chapter before uh, the, the reference in 16, he says, But when the Helper comes, whom I will send the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. So truth, the Spirit of truth, adds this whole incredible dimension to what Jesus is saying. And it really is saying a lot. The Oxford Dictionary says that the truth is the quality of being true, that which is in accordance with reality. How many know that our world has not got any idea what this means? To be centered in reality, the philosophies of this age will do everything that they can to fight against what is true, even what is biologically true. So this definition is, is, is a sufficient one, and I believe that it is, then Compared to the world that we live in, truth is in sharp contrast to a lot of things today. The, the popular mantra in America is to say to live your own truth, you know, the Oprah doctrine. You got your truth, I got my truth, you live your truth as long as we leave one another alone, which is contrary to the gospel, the person who regenerated with the Spirit of God wants to blurt it on everybody. I mean, how many before you were Christians were annoyed by Christians, Right? We're kind, of, we're kind of some of the most annoying people in the world because we have this relationship with God. We can't express it to people because the Bible says that those who don't have the Spirit of God can't comprehend the things of God. They're beyond their ability to bear or, or understand. But those who've had experience with God understand it, and we do. The lie is that many people are offended and escape from conviction over their sin by believing lies so deeply, and they've told themselves the lies for so long, and for them, they're true. And so the philosophy is based on lies, so many lies, so many things. And, and people that you know, that you're around, that you see all the time. And they, they've, they've developed in their life excuses and reasons not to believe. And they come up with everything, that, and I've argued with them. I've argued with people, and, I've, and arguing never does any good. Argue, I can argue with the best of anyone concerning the facts about God as creator, maker, designer, uh, the omniscient, all, the all-knowing God who was pre-existent eternity and created all things. I've, I've got all the arguments from the cosmological one all the way to the moral arguments. All of those things that seem to seep into our college campuses today and try to drive everybody nutso to where they're ble- believing their own truth because all of this information, just as the Bible says in the last day, because there will be so much information that so much knowledge, the love of most will grow cold. Why? Because the knowledge doesn't have to be true. And in our pockets and our cell phones, we can tap into Google and ask Siri whatever we want. She knows a lot. Sometimes I'll even ask her, tell me a joke. And she does. Truth is in contrast to the common facts about reality. Uh, known to be reality, I mean, I should say. Truth is reality. Jesus says that the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth by communicating God's will. The Father, the Trinity, the perfect three W's, right? Of what we've designed, God being the will, the Father being the will, the Son being the word of God, as Scripture says in John, and the Holy Spirit, the W, the ways or the will of God. It's a great analogy for those that always are trying to describe the Trinity to which even the best of theologians has not yet been able to do, but it is there. The Father being the will, the Son, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, the work, or the ways of God. Oprah's definition is the definition, just live your truth. And it's a popular one. There's been books that have been written analyzing her very statement. What, true, what is true is defined singularly. 
And it is not in competition with itself, it just simply is. Everything else is only not true or a lie. And friends, we need the Holy Spirit in greater measure today to discern what is true. The truth comes with a cost in our world today. It comes at great cost. Truth comes with a cost. Truth is powerful. Truth can be dangerous. And the great gift the Holy Spirit brings to our life is truth. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, D.M. Dawson, I think I, do I have this quote up there? It might be on your papers. D.M. Dawson says this, Without the power of the Holy Spirit, all human efforts, methods, and plans are futile as attempting to propel a boat by puffing the sails with your own breath. The point is that there's much more powerful things at work for truth than whatever we can conjure up. More powerful things than our efforts could ever hope to achieve, that our own efforts could ever hope to, to have. The point is that Jesus is making, hey, to your advantage as believers. This is an advantage for a believer. Those who are not believers can't comprehend this, but the truth will be with you. You'll be able to discern. You'll have conviction, the spirit of truth. We're not cessationists here, so... Okay, all of you that may be cessationists, I pray for you that you'll come to the light. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit is at work today. He didn't cease or stop. Many in Christendom believe that it, it was over at the end of the apostles' time and that, that all the things that are happening in the world today are just a carryover of what they did and accomplished. Well, that is not true. The Holy Spirit hasn't left yet. The Holy Spirit is still here. And the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit, is, is still on the table. Never discount experiences with the Holy Spirit. God has those for His church today. God can fill you with the Spirit and transform your life. He can change you from the inside out. I have seen Him get a hold of the most wretched of us, the most depressed of us, the most addicted of us. Grab us by the bootstraps and pull us up. And say you are worth more than what the world has bought you to be and worth more than what you yourself have lied yourself into. The Holy Spirit does so much work. Man, it's quiet in here. Come on. Man, what a, this is not a Baptocostal church. It's a Pentecostal one. <laughs> the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, will confront every lie that you have believed and every lie that you've told. And as He fills you with all of his presence, all that junk will have to flee. And, and I know this to be true. As a young man, I had experience with the Holy Spirit. I had experience, have had experience with the Holy Spirit this week. I have sensed his presence. I have um, sensed the direction of his spirit. I have heard God's voice by reading and meditating on his word and, and having his, his principles explode in my spirit. I've had a peace and a joy because I'm in relationship with God and no longer in competition with him. The truth is loving. 1 Corinthians 13, 6 says, Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Of all the words you could ever say to someone, the most loving words are to share the gospel with them. And this is a great offense in our world today. It is something we're, that's trying to be hushed. You know, for years, it was believed you couldn't talk about Jesus in the classroom. But any student can. Any, any student can, and during non-instructional time, you can read your Bible, you can pray, you can do whatever you want as a student in school. But the, the campuses and the workplaces are becoming more and more indifferent to people that love Jesus. We are on an uphill battle where the world is here, and, the, and many in Christendom believe the church should just be kind of a counterculture, like, you know, pop music, R&B. But the church, should, not just a subculture, but church should be a counterculture. We are opposite. Some of the most loving words we could do say is one of the most, um, how many know who Penn Gillette is? The comedy magician in Las Vegas. Very popular guy, right? Atheist. I mean, totally against Christians. Very antagonistic toward Christians. And he says, um, if Christians really believe in hell and eternity, they must really hate me not to tell me what they believe in. Come on, friends. The most loving thing you can do for someone is to tell them about Jesus. He is the Savior of the world. He is the only way to heaven. There is an eternity, and there's a choice to be made. And we bear the burden of carrying that message, you and I. It is loving. John 16, 8, Jesus says the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And there will be some. Some of the Bibles use the word convince. The Holy Spirit will convince people of the truth. It's his job. 
No one who loves children teaches them lies or tells them lies. They teach them the truth uh, to, pre- to protect them from lies. So quickly, seven ways that the spirit of truth affects us. The spirit of truth is powerful. Number one, he brings us to Christ. I mentioned this earlier last week. His primary work is to convict the world of the sin of unbelief. This is why evangelism and serving Christ is, is so important. Um, this is why people that are in grayness in a spirit-filled church because the Holy Spirit speaks the truth that Jesus saves. 1 John 5, 6, he writes, And Jesus Christ was revealed as God's Son by his baptism in water and by shedding his blood on his cross, not by water only, but by water and blood. And the Spirit, who is the truth, confirms it with his testimony. Confirms it. The Holy Spirit brings us to Christ. Secondly, he purifies our soul. Purifies our soul. Now, understanding the teaching of Jesus on the soul is really important. We get this idea of the body, soul, and spirit, right? And we understand that it is absolutely true. The soul, the body is the body. It is what it is. The soul is that part of you, your consciousness that's born with you when you're born. And you've had your soul your whole life. It is who you are. And in your soul, there's a, it's like a big a, a chess board and it's got all these squares on it and all these squares have um, joy and peace and lust some of them and anxiety and sometimes we let on some portions of the battlefield and some of the squares things that we keep in our life from hurts and pains in the past and and it takes it's a it's a job to uproot them and the continual battle in life is for us to see God working in our life through his word and his spirit to uproot those things from the battlefield of the soul. Your soul is who you are. It is your history, and it comprises everything about you. Scripture tells us, and the Bible teaches through Paul's writings, that we're born again, this, our, we're born with a dead spirit, and our spirit is made alive or rejuvenated, made alive in Christ, and then we are born again. So sometimes our whole life we've lived, if we live, we come to Christ at 25 years old, our soul has had 25 years of experience to compete with the will of the Spirit. And so we're in this constant battle because the battle is to let the soul now be subject to the Spirit rather than the Spirit subject to the soul. And we find ourselves in this, it's, it's something that we all go through. But the Bible says that the Holy Spirit's work is to purify our soul. Look at 1 Peter 1.22. Now that you have purified yourself by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. You've heard it said that the truth hurts, right? I love the fact that the scripture says the truth purifies our heart. But sometimes the truth hurts. It hurts more when there are a lot of lies there, when there are a lot of ground given up in that checkerboard, that chessboard of the soul. And after a while, we struggle and we, we never wrestle with God, but we wrestle with issues in God's presence, and he helps us. This is made real because our conscience reveals what's in our soul. And our conscience is a big part of it. When we defile our conscience, it hurts, we're angry, we're upset, we, we have an angst. And, and it's as if there's junk in the soul, the conscience is, feels guilty. Our soul, friends, is where the enemy deposits lies, lies about your life. He deposits lies about your purpose. He deposits lies about your failures. Our soul is a depository for addictions that drag us and can drag us away from Christ. But Jesus said that the spirit of truth will convict or convince us of what is true and will purify the soul and clear the conscience. This is a great benefit for believers. It is the advantage believers have. Because we have the Holy Spirit working on us. We have a purified conscience, a soul that doesn't walk around with a guilty conscience because we realize that even though we've sinned, even though we've done wrong, Christ has borne those things. And when we believe and trust in Him, we realize He took that stuff to the cross for us. This is a, this is a healing psychologically. This is, a, this is not just metaphorical. This is a freedom that comes out and is expressed by our bodies. This morning, those of you who know Christ and were worshiping Him, we were raising our hands just like the psalmist did because he was rejoicing in the Lord because God had done something in his life that was different, that was new. He had transformed him. 
because Jesus died on the cross and bore those things, our spirit is made alive. Number three, he gives direction. The Holy Spirit gives direction. Jesus says here that the Spirit will guide us and lead us by the truth. It's another powerful advantage that believers have. We don't have to stumble around aimlessly, praise God, without hope. We know what God's plan and will is. We have His Word, and we have the church, the Bible says, fellow believers, to help us in that walk. The church is the family of God. A lot of people find their families at their, uh, you know, in their bars and taverns and all these places. And some in families, these things, some of those things aren't bad. But the significance of the church is empowered 12,000 times because the Spirit of God is at work through us. Then David's plea in Psalm 43, and he says, O oh Lord, uh, O oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is beginning point, a direction in life. I, I know that there's many young people that struggle with and find purpose and in, in, in direction in life. And, and there's a lot of families that are struggling with purpose and direction for their, for their families. And the, the call of God is for us to wait on him, let him speak to us with his power and fill us with his truth. Fourthly, the Holy Spirit um, helps us to build strong and healthy relationships. Truth also makes us trustworthy before people. Relationships are important. Uh, if we want to succeed, we need to be truthful. An employer, somebody wants you to be truthful rather than dishonest. Relationships and marriages. I want to give us a little quiz. Here's a little test. Do you ask others to point out your blind spots? Do you confront your blind spots with the Bible? Do you believe you have no serious faults? Do I have these questions? Maybe I don't. And that you think that you are better than you are? No. Do you lie or only tell part of the truth to escape the consequences of your actions? We never do that. Do you flatter people to gain their approval? When was the last time you were pulled over for speeding? Do you give damaging reports to others to make yourself look good? Do you guard yourself with false teaching and lies by checking everything against the truth of the Bible and Scripture? If you find yourself struggling to keep up appearances, fighting to maintain the lies, it can be so wearying. Friends, that's such a wearying place to live, isn't it? It's exhausting. Because if we tell one lie or one fallacy, we have to back it up with another and another. And we're just so exhausted. And the Bible says the spirit of truth sets us free for it reveals the truth. Relationship with the spirit produces honesty. It produces honesty, honesty and trustworthiness. And then friendships and relationships that are healthy come from that. Healing in marriage comes from that. It can be achieved through nurturing relationship with the Holy Spirit. Five, the Holy Spirit gives protection. The spirit of truth. Paul told Timothy that if he always speaks the truth, those that accuse him will be ashamed because he stood for what was right and what was true. He knew it was true. He'll be proven right because of honesty and dedication to God. Protection comes when we live by the truth of God's word, when we know that it's in our life. We know when we hear Jesus say, be holy for I'm holy, we say there's no way. That's an exhausting statement, right? Something that we could know is not possible. And this is why God calls us to call out to him for his Holy Spirit. There's no way you can achieve the things in life that you know you should be doing or better at or whatever. It's not possible without relationship with the Holy Spirit. He guides us and leads us. We need to cry out for more of his spirit and more of his presence in our life. And yes, that is a doctrinal position. We are saved by the spirit. He comes in us. We are baptized in the spirit, uh, the Bible says, and, and saved as a deposit of the spirit, baptized in the Holy Spirit. Then this, the Bible says the Holy Spirit comes upon us. And the being filled part is constantly referred to. We're going to get to there in a couple weeks, but we're be being filled all the time. And we get filled up with God's Spirit to, so that we can spill out on people. That's a good thing. This is tougher today, sticking to the truth when the attacks are constantly coming from the world on God's Word. And the removal of the Holy Spirit in our churches has made ministry boring and lifeless. 
The George Barna poll says that less than 17% of evangelicals believe the Bible is the authority for absolute truth. I mean, I find that unfathomable. Years ago, there was a Christian book uh, um, convention in, I think it was in Austin, Texas. And uh, one of the reports that I read was they went around, they asked all of these authors throughout the whole convention if they thought that man was good. And 40% of them said that man was, uh, man was good. The Bible says we're just rotten to the core. The truth of it is, we, we have nothing. There is no hope. You and I have no hope. We're, we're, we're fruitless in our own righteousness. We can try to be as good as we can possibly be good. We're not going to heaven because we're good people. We can be good and try to do good and try to treat everybody right because they're treating us right. We can say it comes to us because of the memes and all the psychological mumbo-jumbo and all the stuff that happens to us is just because we don't want to hurt somebody else. We know what hurts us, so we don't want to hurt. But it's more than that. The truth is expressing and understanding that God's word is true and living by its truth. Amos 8.11, Amos faced the same thing in his day as he was looking forward to these 400 silent years, right? Of the prophecies were going to dry up. There was going to be no more messianic things coming. And look what he says in verse eight, uh, chapter 8, verse 11. He says, the days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land. Not a famine for food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. It's very rare, friends, and that's the way that we should be. Jesus says the Holy Spirit would testify about the word, and, and there is not better protection than to be on the side of God. There's not better protection than to be in his word, to live by the principles of his truth. I'd rather trust in him for the now and in eternity than only for what this life has to offer. The truth protects integrity. The truth protects purity. The truth protects reputation. The truth protects your family. The truth protects your lips. The truth protects your walk. It protects your eyes. And most importantly, it, it protects your heart. The Bible says for co outcome from your heart, the issues and all the issues of life. Sixth, freedom. The Holy Spirit produces this. The spirit of truth, John 8, 32. Know the truth and the truth will set you free. Oswald Chambers wrote, No man ever put a stumbling block in the way of others by telling the truth. Freedom. When we recognize the truth, I've had those, I've had close relationships with people that came to me and they didn't know how to say something because they had to confess something. And I too. And when they finally confess the thing, there's freedom there. And there's a restoration of relationship. There's hope for a renewed, built trust. Freedom. Finally, seven. Authentic worship. John 4, 23. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Worship is to honor with extravagant love and extreme submission. Worship is not just our expressions that we sing here in the room together. It is a lifestyle of worship. That we are in extreme submission to the will of God, not our own. This is indifferent to the world. This is opposite the world. Worship silences the accuser, and the accuser is the enemy of your soul. The psalmist writes in Psalm chapter 8, verse 2, From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. It's so funny, you know, to look at the sports that are going on right now and people we wear our jerseys and our t-shirts of maybe someone who's famous, maybe one of the players that we like, right? It surprises me, though, that, you know, what we do with those things. We wear them a jersey of the person, and we can go to the game and sit in the stand. We can shout their name. They'll never hear us. They don't know us from Adam, and yet we're singing their praises. The Bible says, though, when we worship God, something happens. God hears us. We are not just God's fans. We are his people. We are his children. And we worship him. The Bible says we shut up the mouth of the accuser. And you have an accuser. He's always telling you things. And the accuser, your own flesh, is the greatest enemy. Your own flesh will beat yourself up with yesterday's failures, how you didn't come through, how you didn't keep that promise. 
And all of a sudden, you begin to feel guilty, and it begins to ravage your spirit and take away the freedom and joy that God has for your life. And all of those things come flooding in. The Bible says when you worship God, when you take time to praise Him, all of a sudden, you just tell Him to shut up. I mean, sometimes you just need to come into your prayer closet or out in the living room or the street or the mall, perhaps, or in the sanctuary and just say, I exalt thee. I exalt thee, I exalt thee, O Lord. I exalt thee, O Lord. We just need to worship and say, God, you are worthy. I find sometimes in those times that I, I come to God and I just say, God, I just want to come before you as your worshiper. And I want to surrender my life. And I want to say, Jesus, you are worthy of all praise. Everything that is going on with me, Lord, I know that you know the depths of what's happening. I know you're coming soon, and there's little time, so God, I want to praise you. I want to worship you in spite of what's going on. And you know what? When we take time to do that, we set our agenda aside. God meets up with everything else. This is the little stuff and the big stuff. Remember, my dad always used to say, take care of the little things. The big things will take care of themselves. When we take care of worship, when we steward that right, God begins to work on our life in ways that we could never imagine. And we tell the accuser, your own mind, your own conscience, the enemy's words against you, you tell them to shut up. And you close the mouth of the accuser. The guilt that comes in the conscience when you begin to worship, because the spirit of truth is there, begins to push back against all those noises, against all of those lies. And through genuine worship, as you worship God, as you, as you are letting that flow from your heart out of your mouth and out of your spirit, you tell them to shut up about your family. You, you tell them to shut up about depression. You tell them to shut up about anxieties and fears and about self-worth. You tell them to shut up about your finances or shut up about your failures. You just tell them to shut up. Worship disrupts the demonic. In 1 Samuel chapter 18, David was brought in to sing to Saul because he was troubled. And when David was singing praises, Saul stopped being so harassed by the demonic, the Bible says. Never underestimate the power of worship to stop the enemy from harassing you. True worshipers reminds, true worship reminds the enemy of what he's powerless to do. Look at what the Bible says about this principle. The enemy is powerless. He can't, number one, make you sin. When you worship, James 1.13, each one simply is tempted by his own desires. The enemy can't do that. Satan can't do that. Secondly, he can't make you fear death. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, grave, where is your sting? Death is swallowed up in victory. He can't take your stamina. 1 Corinthians 10, no temptation against you. It's, it's common to man. And the Holy Spirit will guide and lead you. Fourth, he can't pester you after you resist. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. <laughs> Worship does some things. It, it reminds the enemy that, number five, he can't control you. Number six, he can't be everywhere at once. He's not omnipresent. You know, I, I've told this before, but when I was a youth pastor, I uh, worked out this great dramatic thing to all my kids, and they all sit in this semicircle in, in my youth group, and I, a big semicircle, and I had this box, a shoe box. And I said, I captured your greatest enemy, and every once in a while I would shake it, you know, thinking something awful was in there. And I said, I want to go around the room at the end here, and I want to each one to look in the box and see that I've captured your enemy. Stronger than Satan, more powerful than mountains and rivers, bigger than the ocean tide. Here it is. And it was a mirror in the bottom of the box. Ourselves. He can't take your stamina. He can't pester you after resist. Number five, he can't control you. You have a will and have submitted to Christ. Number six, he can't be everyone wants. Number seven, any anything without God, he can't do anything without God's permission. We find this example in Job. Everything that's happening in your life, friends, whether you like it or not, has already come across God's desk for approval. He knows what you can handle. He understands life is going to have its things. The Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust alike. None of us are going to escape this world. We live in a sinful world. I'm so thankful that one day we're going to be out of here. He can't steal your faith. Ephesians 6 tells us to take up that shield of faith and we stop the, the, the weapons of the enemy. Number nine, he can't commandeer your future. No one, the Bible says, Jesus will snatch you out of my hand. He can't win. Revelation 12.10 
For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them before the Lord day and before uh, accuses them before the Lord day and night. I mean, you're constantly being accused. You're constantly being harassed and beat up. The Holy Spirit, when you when we when we worship, we create an environment to experience the presence of the Holy Spirit. Psalm 2, 22, 3. David says this powerful scripture, and I want to end with these thoughts. He says, you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. The promise is made perhaps a little more plain in the good old King James Version. In Psalm 22 and verse 3 where it says, but thou art holy, thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel, of your people, some say that God inhabits the praises of his people. Inhabits or enthroned, the word Yeshua. And Yeshua meaning something occupied, a place that's dwelt in, a place that's conquested. <laughs> I find that so amazing. And in context, this psalm is a messianic psalm. Psalm 22 is all about Jesus. It talks about the, the soldiers. Um, I mean, this is... More than a thousand years before Christ. And here the psalmist is talking about the significance of Jesus' clothes being bartered for at the foot of the cross. Talks about him being pierced in the side. Talks about the fact that his bones were not broken. I mean, this is all prophesied way before Jesus. It's a messianic psalm, perhaps the best known of all, about his crucifixion. And, and there's no mistaking the meaning in this context of, the, of these literal words. It's as if Jesus himself is speaking as David prophesies, and God, your presence, dwells in the praises of your people. That God, your Holy Spirit, lives there. Even though he's in you, friends, his Holy Spirit will come upon you when you worship. You sit, O oh God, your presence enthroned on the praises of your people in worship. In summary, be filled with His Spirit. Be filled with His Spirit. The breaking of the things that are in your life, friend, the hardships that you may be facing, the wonderings you've always wondered about, the place that you're at where you've never been sold out for Christ, God, to tell you that's the only place to be. And God is calling us to break down the walls of what has been and come into the place of knowing Him intimately by the presence of His Spirit. Pam, would you come? So being filled with the Spirit, and I love this scripture, Ephesians chapter 5. It's the last one. Paul writes, he says, For you were once darkness, but now you are children of the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, godliness, and truth. And then he says, find out what pleases the Lord. <laughs> Have nothing to do with foolish deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. And everything illuminated becomes a light. This is why it's said, wake up, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will rise, shine on you. Be there, very careful in how you live, as wise, not as unwise. Making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. In verse 17, therefore don't be foolish. But understand what the Lord's will is. Don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, but rather be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks to God the, the Father in everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. The priority of our life, no matter where we've come from, no matter what we've done, is to give God glory is to give him the praise that comes from the depths of our soul. Understanding, friends, that you were bought with a price. And the Bible says to glorify God with our body and to give him praise and honor and to worship him from everything we know to be true, that we were lost without him, that, that we have no hope without him, that there is nothing in this world that can satisfy the appetite of a life except for being acquainted with the creator who designed and made us. By practicing worship and powerfully engaging the presence of God and asking him to be filled with his spirit. See, being filled with God's spirit isn't something that just happens to us once. Being filled with God's spirit is the idea in Ephesians 5.18 is that he's talking to us and he's saying, hey, be being filled. It's a, it's a continual thing. 
Don't just, you know, have an experience with God and then walk away and, and say, oh, that was enough. I remember when I was a kid, way back when, and, and we went to camp, and I, or I was a youth, and I had this great experience with God. I went to this church service, and there was this awesome preacher who had big bell-bottom pants. Like he hovered when he walked, you know. And he was preaching in the Spirit, and I, I had an experience with God. Back when, you know, Moses was around, I had an experience with God. I remember praying and that one night where I really hear, heard God touch me. Well, why stop? What has stopped you, friend, from getting closer and more acquainted with the Holy Spirit? If, as Jesus says, that He is God and that He was present at creation, He is present in the end times. And the Bible says one attribute about the Holy Spirit that's so powerful, He will be with the church forever. We will have relationship with Him forever. But this is a non-stop pursuit. This is not like we go to the store and buy enough groceries for a week. we got to be going back again because we're just going to get hungry. One thing I know about eating good, you just get hungry again. I love to eat good food. Give me some good Italian right now. I mean, I'm just ready, right? Even pizza sounds good right now. It's almost, I mean, it's almost lunchtime. But just as one experience isn't going to be enough. And we can't treat God like a buffet where we come and we just take all the things that we kind of want. We need to take the whole thing and recognize that the Holy Spirit's job today is to show us His truth, that the Savior exists. And that's the premium top thing. The people that are far from God are convicted by their sin and they're miserable. They've learned to deal with the misery, coping mechanisms all through their life. But God is saying, I want to break through that. I want to change that. I want you to surrender. I want you to come and ask me to come in your life. Accept me as the new authority. Trust me. And for his church to be being filled. Amen. Thank you for watching Abundant Life Church. If you found this teaching helpful, please subscribe to our page and share us with a friend. Also, please consider giving at nwlife.org.